going to look at a nice little calculus problem, which is from a calculus book, which I think most math professors consider to be the greatest calculus book of all time, which is kind of interesting because I know very few schools that use it as their textbook. So there's some sort of disconnect there, but I also agree that it is one of the greatest calculus books of all time, and we don't use it as a textbook at my institution. So it's from the text titled Calculus by M. Spivak. So what we wanna do is let A be a positive real number, so it's bigger than zero, and then we wanna find the maximum value of this function here. So it's defined by f of x equals one over one plus the absolute value of x, plus one over one plus the absolute value of x minus a. So let's see how we can get started with this. First off, I wanna take this function f of x and I wanna split it into three pieces. And those are gonna depend on why, whether the input into this absolute value is positive or negative, this absolute value is positive or negative, or kind of both have some sort of over overlapping positiveness or negativeness. So I first want to notice that if x is less than zero, then x minus a is also less than zero by this condition, which means the absolute value of x and the absolute value of x minus a can be replaced with the negative values of what's inside the absolute value. In other words, negative x and negative x minus a. So let's maybe go ahead and write that down. So we have one over one minus x plus one over one minus this, but after moving some things around, we see that's, that's one plus a minus x. And again, I said that is for the case when x is less than zero. Next, we can see that when x is between zero and a, at this point, absolute value can be replaced with just positive x because here x is positive but this absolute value will be replaced with negative of its argument that's because if x is less than a x minus a is negative so that tells us what this function looks like here so we've got 1 over 1 plus x plus 1 over 1 plus a minus x so again, I've replaced absolute value of x with x, and I've replaced absolute value of x minus a with a minus x. Okay, and then finally, if x is bigger than a, we know that the argument of each of these absolute value functions is positive, so that means we can just erase the absolute values, and that is the version of the function that we need there. So we've got this is one over one plus x, plus one over one, minus a plus x. So I'll write it like that. So I'll um, rearrange the a and the x there. Next, we can take the derivative of this on each of these intervals. And we'll do that just using standard derivative rules. So let's find f prime of x. So up here, well, we're gonna use either the quotient rule or the chain rule, and that will be the chain rule connected with the power rule, thinking about this guy right here as one minus x to the minus one, and then this guy right here is one plus a minus x to the minus one. So maybe that's the easiest way to take these derivatives, although we'll just like jump to having the derivatives taken. So the derivative of this term right here is one over one minus x quantity squared, and then the derivative of this right here is one over one plus a minus x quantity squared. And so that's what the derivative of this function looks like for all negative values of x. Now we can move on to the derivative of this middle portion. So that's gonna give us minus one over one plus x quantity squared. So we don't have a minus sign here because the minus one from the exponent canceled with the minus one that we get from the chain rule. But we didn't have that happen in this term. And then next we'll have this is plus one over one plus a minus x quantity squared. And this is for x between zero and a. Then finally, we can take the derivative of this portion. That will give us minus one over one plus x quantity squared minus one over one minus a plus x quantity squared. Notice we've got a minus sign on both of these terms here because the chain rule doesn't allow us to cancel the one that we get from the exponent. And this is for when x is bigger than a. 
Okay, so let's maybe bring this derivative up and then we'll finish it off. On the last board, we took our goal function, wrote it as a piecewise function using the piecewise definition of the absolute value, and then took the derivative of each of those portions. And this is what we got. Now we want to find all of the critical points. So the critical points are when f prime of x equals zero or when f prime of x does not exist. And it's important to look for both of those. So here, f prime could not exist for two reasons, either at the overlap of these spots. So in other words, x equals zero will be a place where f prime does not exist, and x equals a will also be a place where f prime does not exist. So let's maybe point that out here first. So x equals zero and x equals a are automatically critical points. And this, that's just based on the piecewise definition of this function or the absolute value definition of this function. Next, we might think that there could be critical points where the derivative has a zero in the denominator, but notice there are no zeros in the denominator based off of the denominators from these rational functions and the domains that they are attached to. So in fact, these are the only places where the derivative does not exist. So now we need to find out where the derivative is equal to zero. And carefully looking at this first portion, we see that we're adding two things that are squared. But if we're adding two things that are squared, well, then that's gonna be bigger than or equal to zero. But then given the fact that they are one over something, then they're always bigger than zero. So that means we're adding together two things that are bigger than zero. So the result will be bigger than zero. Next up, we'll look at this part down here and see that we are adding two things that are squared and then multiplied by a negative one. So by a similar argument to what we have up here in yellow, we know that this portion is always less than zero. So all that leaves us with is this portion in the middle has the possibility of being equal to zero. Now, is it ever equal to zero? Well, we don't know yet. We'll have to set that equation equal to zero and solve to see if we get that. And that's what we'll do right here. But notice this object is equal to zero if this thing is equal to this thing. Because notice we've got the second term minus this first term equals zero, so that means it would be equivalent to having the second term equal to the first term. So let's just start with that equation. We have one over one plus a minus x quantity squared equals one over one plus x quantity squared. But now maybe by taking the reciprocal of both sides and the square root of both sides, we see that we get one plus a minus x equals one plus x. Now you should be a little bit worried here because we took a positive square root and didn't even worry about the negative square root. We can be sure that the positive square root is the correct root to take given that we are between zero and a for values of x. Okay, great. So now this equation is pretty easy to solve and we'll see that we get x equals a over two. So that's our third critical point. So we get two critical points from where the first derivative does not exist, and we get a third from where the derivative is equal to zero. So next up, we'll set up a first derivative chart based on these critical points. Okay, so let's say this is our real number line. We'll put zero on our real number line here, a over two here, and then a here. And then up here, we'll look at the sine of f prime, and then we'll draw down here if it's increasing or decreasing. So let's look if we plug in something that is less than zero into our function f prime. But notice if we're plugging in something less than zero, it's gonna be firmly in this portion right here. But as we explained over there, that's always positive. So that means our f prime is positive here. So we've got an increasing function here. Next, we need to plug in something between zero and a over two. So I would maybe pick like a over four because that'll be the easiest one to work with. But if we plug in a over four into this portion of the function, because that is where that lies in the domain, we'll see that we in fact get a negative number. So that means that this function will be decreasing 
between zero and A over two. Then next, we need to plug in something between A over two and A. So I would maybe choose three A over four, and what you'll see is that that will give you a positive value when plugged in here. So that means our function is increasing here. Finally, if we plug in something to the right of A, by this argument that we made right here, we see that we get a decreasing function, so it's going like that. Next, we see that the fact that this is decreasing to increasing will tell us that A over two is a local minimum, whereas the fact that we're going from increasing to decreasing at zero and A, that tells us that zero and A represent local maximums. So here we've got a local max there and a local maximum there. Furthermore, if you move rightward from A, our function is decreasing off of that local maximum. And if we move leftward from zero, the function is decreasing off of that local maximum, which will tell us that one of these local maximums is necessarily a global maximum. So we'll figure out what that value is by plugging zero and A into our original function. So notice that we have f evaluated at zero. Well, that's pretty easy to calculate. That's gonna be one plus one over one plus a. But we can simplify that a little bit and we see that we very quickly get a plus two over a plus one. So next, let's see what's happening at f of a. If we plug in a, we'll get, so this bit right here will be one over one plus a, but then the second bit right here will be one. And so adding that together again will give us a plus two over a plus one. So it turns out that we get the same value of the function at zero and a, meaning that these local maximums were in fact global maximums and we've actually achieved this maximum value of the function. And that would be this a plus two over a plus one value. And that's a good place to stop.